Turn with me to the book of 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Ah, Veteran Sunday, and oh, we have the privilege every year to par or have put on this Veteran Sunday, and I normally preach a message about a soldier in the Bible, and here in 2 Timothy chapter 4, we find the Apostle Paul. He's at the end of his life, he's describing his life. And he's describing the Christian life as being a battle, a war. And he begins to think about the fights that he's gone through. And uh, as we read this, you'll notice that he mentions he fought a good fight. And so if you can, if you're able, stand with me for the reading of God's Word. We're going to read 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6, 7, and 8. And how we'll do it is we'll read it all together in unison, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6, 7, and 8. Ready? For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. In verse number 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. By the way, the Apostle Paul, he fought a good fight. Something that was worth living his life for. He kept the faith and praise God. To this morning's message, I have fought a good fight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we love you. It's been a good day. Thank you for the Brother Frank being baptized this morning in the early bird service. Lord, thank you for the decisions that were made. Thank you for the guests you have brought us. Thank you for uh, Brother Pete. Thank you, Lord, for Brother Gennaro. Thank you for Brother Randy and his hard work. And Lord, thank you most of all for meeting with us this morning. Lord, I pray there might be somebody here this morning who's never accepted you as their Savior. Maybe they don't even know they need a Savior. I pray that you help them this morning to make that decision, realize their only hope is you, Jesus. But Lord, I pray you work in a mighty way this morning. We love you. We need you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Oh, I have fought a good fight. Oh, and uh, we think about our veterans here, and we think about military personnel. They're trained to fight. They're trained to uh, battle. There was a lieutenant uh, Miller, back in World War II, near the Solomon Islands, his ship was torpedoed and his ship uh, sunk. There were 24 of them that were able to survive. They made it over to Solomon's Island. And uh, there, Lieutenant Miller, he was hemorrhaging internally and he was on the path of death. And he began to, as a senior officer, began to instruct the men. He gave them some of his clothing. He gave them his shoes. He said, leave me here. You men try to get out of this situation. The men left. There he was about to die. And Lieutenant Miller, as he was laying there, uh, seemingly die, he passed out and uh, woke up surprisingly the next day. He was alive. Two days passed. He used up his water supply and he prayed to God. He said, God, if you send me rain, I'll try my best to live. Sure enough, in the middle of the night, uh, God sent a four-hour rain uh, pour right there. He's able to get water. He crawled about 100 yards away, and there was a coconut that he pried open, and he began to eat a coconut. And the days began to pass. He began to get better. There were patrols of the Japanese there on that island. One of the PT boats from the United States uh, engaged in fire with some of the Japanese. And one of the Japanese people uh, gotten killed right there. He was able to crawl out there. He took the shoes off that Japanese soldier, some of the clothes, and he was clothed. Uh, the days went by, the uh, plane flew over the island, he was able to signal for uh, the, um, the United States uh, that was up there in the sky, whatever you want to say, he said, uh, I'm here, and they sent a rescue boat to him, and he was saved, uh, Lieutenant Hill uh, Miller was saved uh, dramatically during World War II. He was trained as a soldier, he was trained to fight, and he was fighting a good battle for the liberty, you might say, of the whole world. Back here in 2 Timothy, if you'll look with me, uh, you see that uh, the Apostle Paul, he says, I, For I am now ready to be offered. This is verse 6. And the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a what? Good fight. He, we think about it, the Apostle Paul says, I have fought a good fight. A good fight. 
The Apostle Paul used to be named Saul. He was uh, actually, Saul at that period in his life was, uh, in early age, he was a, not a Christian. He was a persecutor of Christianity. He was on the road from Jerusalem to Damascus, and the reason he was going to Damascus was to find Christians, bind them, and bring them bound uh, back into prison there in Jerusalem, have them tried for their Christianity. On the road to Damascus, God appeared to him, he blinded him with the light, and uh, began the salvation testimony of the Apostle Paul. And he said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And he bowed down. He trusted Christ as a Savior. Praise the Lord. The Apostle Paul uh, was gloriously saved on the road to Damascus. Now, it's so interesting. We make a long story short. He eventually went to Damascus, and he began to serve the Lord with all of his might. He was baptized. He went to the synagogue, preached the gospel, and he began to uh, fight the good fight. If there's a good fight, there is a bad fight, is there not? Uh, I remember my dad. Uh, my dad growing up when we lived in uh, Lafayette, Colorado. Somebody came by the door and uh, began to ring the doorbell. Ding, 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 ding. And my dad opened the door. There was nobody there. A few minutes later, somebody came by the doorbell. Ding, 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 ding. My dad opened the door. There was nobody there. So my dad was enraged. He began to go around the neighborhood looking who was ringing that doorbell. About 15 minutes later, my dad came in the door and he was wobbling a little bit. He said, who am I? Where am I? And come to find out, he accused somebody of ringing the doorbell and the guy punched him. <laughs> now, my, I would say that that was a bad fight to get involved in. There are good fights, there are bad fights. Yesterday, I met a young man named James. I invited him to church. And uh, James looked at me and he said, I can't, I don't have any time to go to church. And I wasn't, I mean, it was a good friendly conversation. I said, James, why, why don't you have time to go to church? He said, well, you don't understand, I play video games. And I said, well, what, what, what game are you playing? He said, well, I play this game called Kingdom Come. And he got excited when I asked him what video games I play this game called Kingdom Come. He said, I have a horse that I fall off sometimes. It's a hard game. And he began to describe it. He was intense about this. And after, I had to stop him after a little bit, and I said, how, how much have you been playing this game? In the last 48 hours, the last two days, how much have you been playing this Kingdom Come game? And he said, oh, at least 24 hours. And that's why he couldn't come to church. I want to say he is living his life, and he's fighting a fight that is not really a fight, but that's not a good fight to fight. Yeah. Amen? And I want to say there is a good fight there is a bad fight. It's important for us to fight a fight that's worth fighting. Amen. Yeah. read a story of a man named Joe Meek, and he was a fur trapper in the northwest side of the United States back in the 1830s. And he had married and named a, a woman named Isabel, and they would go hunt wild buffaloes, and they would get their meat from that and their furs from the wild buffalo. And uh, as they got the wild buffalo, their hunt was successful. The men were traveling in a sort of a posse, you might say, in the front, and the women were traveling behind. And uh, little did he know, his wife's horse had a problem, and uh, she got left behind. He looked back, where's my wife? And the lady said, well, she's back there. Her horse had a problem. So he began to go look for his wife, and he got on a crest of a hill. He looked over, and there was Crow warriors, a, a group of Indians that had surrounded his wife and were about to take her. And it was difficult. They outnumbered the fur traders right there. And the fur traders were right there. What are you going to do? And he said, I'm going to go get her. And he went full blast right into the Crow Warriors, shot one of them as he was going right there, and he rescued his wife. By the way, that's a good fight. Amen. He looks back, and he wasn't a coward. He, at the time of a difficult situation where his life could have ever been changed, he went and he uh, rescued his wife. There was a man named Billy Sunday. Have you ever heard of Billy Sunday? And Billy Sunday was a famous baseball player back in the 1800s. He played for the Chicago, at that period of time, White Stockings. And uh, uh, Billy Sunday, or William Sunday, was the fastest baseball player back in the day. And he was known for stealing bases. And uh, he wasn't living for the Lord. Uh, he didn't have uh, the Lord in his life. He didn't care about the things of God. He would often go to downtown Chicago with his buddies, and they would go to bars. And uh, William Sunday, or Billy Sunday, was going by a place called the Pacific Garden Mission in Chicago, and he began to hear some familiar songs that he heard as a child growing up. And he began to listen, and uh, after the singing, a man got up and he began to preach the gospel. 
And Billy Sunday began to think about his life, his sin, and he realized his need of a Savior, and he called on the name of the Lord and got gloriously saved. When I say gloriously, got gloriously saved simply by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Well, Billy Sunday realized he was a sinner destined to die and go to hell. He realized his only hope was Jesus and called on the name of the Lord, uh, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And he got gloriously saved. Amen. But there he is. He's a famous baseball player. He goes back to the team and still plays. And he begins to look at what he's, by the way, paid $3,500 a year. Woo, he was living large, wasn't he? But by the way, at that period of time, that was a lot of money. But as he's playing baseball, he begins to look at his life. He says, what am I really doing with my life playing baseball? What am I really accomplishing playing baseball? He had an offer for, uh, to play. He was actually at that period transferred to pay for the, the Pittsburgh Pirates. And he was offered another contract. There was a substantial amount of money at that time. But then an offer came from the YMCA of Chicago, Youth um, Young Men's Christian Association. He was offered a salary of $68 a month. Not a week, but a month to go work for the YMCA. And he said, forget the professional baseball, I'm going to go live for the Lord. I'm going to serve the Lord. By the way, can I say that's a good fight? And it began to lead him in a path where he began to be a front man for Wilbur B. Champion, a, an evangelist. And then Billy Sunday lived his life as an evangelist, pointing people to Jesus Christ. It was a good fight. It was a good fight. It was a good fight. Listen, you and I have a choice with our lives. What are you going to do with your life? Are, are, you, in the, are you in the good fight? Has there been a time in your life when you've been gloriously saved? Has there been a time in your life when you've trusted Jesus Christ as your only hope for heaven? If you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you would go to heaven? We were out and about as a, church, as a church yesterday, inviting people to church and telling people about the Lord. And me and uh, Brother Rash came across uh, uh, two ladies. They were in their 30s. And I looked at her and said, if you were to die today, are you 100% sure you'd go to heaven? And both of those ladies said, well, we hope so. And I said, well, wouldn't it be better if you knew so? Can I show you what the Bible says about how you can know for sure you're going to heaven when you die? And they were both excited. I gave them the gospel. I said, listen, the Bible tells us that we are all sinners. By the way, do you understand that you've sinned? And they both said, oh, yes, we've sinned. And then I took them to the scriptures, and I showed them that the, there's a price for each, and for the wages of sin is death. And I showed them from the book of, of Genesis in the beginning of the Bible all the way to the book of Revelation, there's only one way for you to pay for your sins yourself. There's only one way that I'd be able to pay for my sins myself. And the Bible says that we'd have to pay for them by dying and going to hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. By the way, the ladies looked at me like some of you are looking at me. Uh, are you sure about that? I don't like that. By the way, hell is not good. Hell is bad. But the only way you could ever pay for your sins yourself would be to die and burn in hell for all of eternity. A sad fact, is it not? And the ladies looked at me and said, well, what about going to church or reading Bible? Wouldn't that help? I said, no, it doesn't help at all. Uh, the Bible is not the way to heaven. Church attendance is not the way to heaven. You being good is not the way to heaven. But there is good news. There is one way to heaven, only one way. And the good news is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Hey, Jesus came 2,000 years ago, lived a perfect life, died on the old rugged cross for our sins. Three days later, he rose from the grave, proving he was God. And I said to those ladies, there's only hope for you to, to go to heaven, and it's Jesus. You have, your sins have to be paid for, but if you pay for them, you'll pay for them in hell. But if you trust Christ to pay for your sins, you accept that gift of eternal life, you'll go to heaven when you die. And they both looked, and they said, well, isn't it Jesus plus us going to church? And I said to him, I said, pray, frankly, I said, how, how many times has Jesus failed you? And they both said, never. I said, how often do you fail? How often do you sin? They both bowed their head like this. And by the way, it's not Jesus plus me that gets me to heaven. It's Jesus and Jesus alone. For it's, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Hey, your only hope for heaven is... Jesus. They both bowed their head right then, and they both called on the name of the Lord. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
the only hope for you, the only hope for me to ever to get to heaven is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Have you joined the, the winning side? Have you joined the team Jesus? The only way you can join that team is to call upon the name of the Lord. I want to encourage you, if you're here this morning, you're not sure you're going to heaven when you die, you've never had that day when you were born again. Boy, let today be that day that you've been born into God's family. The only way is Jesus. Amen. Now, if we go back to uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, I want you to look at verse number 7 with me again. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. You see that phrase? I have finished my course. Oh, boy. Some of you don't even know where 2 Timothy is, and that's okay. I'll read it to you. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Oh, we got it. Just... Some of you, like to do a holy grunt, just pretend you're reading with me or something. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. I'll do it one more time because we'll get this together. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Now it almost sounds like we got it there. We'll try it one more time and pretend the last 30 seconds didn't happen. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Paul finished his course. And this is important. He finished God's plan for his life. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? The Apostle Paul began to live for the Lord. He was blinded, went to Damascus after he'd been saved, and there he met a man named Ananias. Ananias laid his hands on him. The Apostle Paul received his sight. He hadn't eaten or drinking anything for three days, and immediately he went and was baptized. Baptized, why? He wanted to please the Lord. And then after that, he received sustenance, and then he went into the synagogues and began to preach and say, hey, uh, I've made a mistake. I used to say that Christians were wrong, but boy, I was wrong. Jesus is the way. He is the truth. By the way, he lost his job. Lost his job, but he gained a job for Jesus. Amen. And he began to tell people about Jesus Christ, and people were gloriously saved. And he began to live his life fighting the good fight. He kept the faith at the end of his life in 2 Timothy chapter 2. He's able to look back and he said, you know, I struggled. I had difficulties. It was a battle. It was a fight. But I fought that fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. I didn't get sidetracked. I didn't get uh, carried away with some other thing. And you think about it. You've joined the good fight. You're on the winning side. It's important for you to get the battle. Amen. Boy, get in the battle for the Lord. Get in the battle for the Lord. We're all trained to be selfish from a young age. We're all trained to be selfish. Sometimes, by the way, your parents have done that. Sometimes it's society. Sometimes it's your own sinful nature inside of you to live for self. I want to do. I just think. I just want this for my life. But the Apostle Paul, it's a little bit different. He said, listen, it doesn't matter what I want. It matters what he wants. It doesn't matter where I want to go. It matters where he wants me to go. And he began to live his life for the Lord. By the way, may I park here for just a moment? Uh, some of you uh, need to realize you've been gloriously saved. Praise God for that. But it's time to quit living for yourself and start living for the Lord. Quit making excuses why you don't go to church. Quit making excuses why you don't get baptized. Quit making excuses why you don't live for the Lord. I know. Amen. Pastor, I thought this was a friendly service. It is. It's very friendly because it's true. It's true. Boy, you have one life to live. Live for the Lord. Live for the Lord. I read a story about a man named Charlie Loxley. He came to California in about 1849, seeking gold during the California gold rush. And uh, anyways, he started to live there. He's a young man, and uh, he was going out into the wilderness a little bit, out from town. And he came to a giant pine that was overlooking a thousand-foot drop into the Feather River. And all of a sudden, from behind the trees over there, here, just grumbling, that's a grizzly bear, okay? And sure enough, a grizzly bear came out, and there he was, his back against the ravine, the grizzly bear right there, and he began to back out. He had nowhere to go, and he began to back up, and he thought about maybe jumping, uh, but it was a bad situation. He had his hand on uh, a big boulder, and the grizzly bear started to come up, and he felt this rock begin to wiggle, and he picked up as actually a little boulder, and uh, the bear becomes to come in, and he throws that rock at the bear, and as he's throwing it, the grizzly bear is, ah, and the rock threw and went, went into his mouth and in his throat, and the grizzly bear be going, ah. I don't make a very good grizzly bear, I don't think, 
but the grizzly bear tried to swipe at him and actually cut him up a little bit. And the grizzly bear actually landed on top of me, kicked the grizzly bear off, and the grizzly bear fell down into the ravine. Wow. And he walked, walked back to town. He's a little slashed up. And he began to try to tell the townspeople the story of what happened. And they began to laugh at him. Yeah, right. Come on. And he said, well, let's go to look at the ravine. We'll see you in there. And they went to the bottom of the ravine. There was the grizzly bear with a rock lodged in his uh, throat right there. And you think about that. I don't know what that, ha that story has to do with in a sermon, but it's a good story. Okay, it's just a good story. He was willing to fight, and I just thought it was a battle with a bear. A bear attacks you, keep on battling. Okay, so there. So you've joined the good fight. You've been gloriously saved. You're on the winning side. Finish the course. Live for the Lord. Live for the Lord. God has a plan for your life. God has a plan for each and every one of you. He loves you. He cares for you. He's got a plan. Hey, figure out. Say, Lord, what's your plan for my life? And whatever it is he has planned for your life, do it. Live for the Lord. Serve the Lord. By the way, that's why God has given us the Bible. God's given us a Bible so we can learn about his plan for our life. Boy, read the Bible. Study the Bible. Hey, be, make the Bible a part of your life. Don't run from the Bible. Run to the Bible. Have you, ever, have you ever noticed in the world there's an attack on the Bible? Yes, sir. The whole society says, well, the Bible's nothing but a bunch of fairy tales. There's so many errors in the Bible. You know why? Because they attack the truth. They attack the truth. It's a life-changing book. It's the Word of God. It's true from beginning to end. Satan doesn't like this book. Our society doesn't like this book, but it's a true book. It's a life-changing book. It is a wonderful book. Thy Word is truth. By the way, that's why God has given us a church. A church right here, a Bible-believing church. By the way, Grace Baptist Temple is a Bible-believing church. It's the heartbeat of our church. And the Bible, we love it so much here. It's because it helps us to know who God is. We know thy word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto my path. It's what I believe, and hopefully it's what you believe. And it's why we're here this morning, because of the Bible, the word of God, right? Yes. And so a church is important for us because we come together, not as perfect people, but imperfect people who would like to learn more about God from the Word of God. Amen. We come together to encourage one another, to exhort one another, to help one another in the Word of God. Church is so important. If you say in your mind, I don't have time for church, you're saying, I don't have time for God's plan for my life. If you say, I don't have time for the Word of God, you're saying, I don't have time to listen to the King of kings and Lord of lords. If you say, I don't have time for the things of God, what you're saying is the only thing that's important to you is yourself. You understand that? Boy, the important part of this service is to encourage all of us to live for the Lord, to be able to say with the Apostle Paul, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Have you joined the good fight? Have you been gloriously saved? Have you? Well, I hope so. If not, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? By the way, what do you expect a church? <laughs> what did you want me to say this morning? Amen. This is church, and so you're going to hear about God from the Bible. Amen. You'll get your free turkey. It'll be okay. And so, uh, praise the Lord. I, I like turkey also. Amen. <laughs> turkey for some turkeys. And so, have you joined the good fight? Have you trusted Christ as your Savior? If you haven't, boy, there's no better time than getting saved this morning. How about this? Have you been on the right uh, fight? Are you in, in the fight? I want to say join God's team this morning. Don't get sidetracked. Get into the will of God. Heard a story, and I was reminded yesterday of it from uh, Brother Bill, about Douglas MacArthur. Douglas MacArthur was a general from World War II, and General MacArthur had gotten gloriously saved. Praise God. And uh, gent praise God. Amen. That's good. I mean, it's good for somebody to get saved. I thought we'd rejoice in that just for a second. I might preach a message on Wednesday, praise the Lord. But uh, <laughs> part four. And uh, Douglas MacArthur got gloriously saved, and uh, he was given what they call the Romans Road to Heaven. And he found one of the Roman Road's gospel tracts, and it was so important to him, he gathered all of his staff together in 1948 or 49, and he began to point them to the Romans Road, how we're all sinners, the price for our sin is hell, but Jesus is our only hope for heaven. And he began to look at each of his staff members and said, hey, have you trusted Christ as your Savior? 
You need to. You go to the next one. Have you trusted Christ as your Savior? You need to. Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? You need to. Why did he do that? Because it was important. He'd been gloriously saved, and the things of God became important in his life. Well, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. Hey, this morning, it's simple. I want to encourage you, if you're not saved, to get saved. And if you are saved, make sure that you're dedicated to living and fighting the good fight. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we love you. It's been a good morning.